here this morning, another day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice in it. And just like I said, I'd like to welcome you all here. We special welcome, of course, to Tim Challey is here with us. He's going to be filling the pulpit later this morning. He's also contributing to the music as well. We look forward to that. And uh, yeah, it's, okay, I'm going to get this all messed up. RSCBE? RSBCE. Rockies, Rockies Southwest Bible Church Extension. Yes. <laughs> I, I'm never going to get that, but he's, he's been uh, working with us some time in part of the pastoral search and continued to suit, just to lift him, up his, lift him up and his organization in prayer. Anyway, um, this evening, Zach should be finishing up on his flowers versus tulip. And uh, if you haven't been here, I encourage you to be here. It's uh, you know in, in support of Calvinism, and and um, it, he's been giving a, a good uh, summary of s some of the arguments in support of that in the past few weeks. I encourage you to be here as well. Wednesday, six o'clock. I always want to encourage you folks to join us downstairs. We spend a little time with praise, lifting up our voices, some music, and then we spend the remaining time bringing up thanks, praises, and our concerns in prayer. And that's at 6 o'clock downstairs. Definitely would like to encourage you to be there for that. Next Sunday, we have, there it is. It seems like we just had one last month. Anyway, we're going to have another one this month. Another shared meals. So. I believe there usually is a sign-up sheet back there, and I'm getting a heads up. Yes, there is one, so be sure to take advantage of that. Um, next Sunday, we're going to also be welcoming uh, Pastor Al Hansen. He's going to be providing the message next Sunday. He's, he's part of an organization that reaches out, helps out other churches, and would like to welcome here next next week so look forward to that as well and one other item happy father's day and um, linda has already prepared some gifts for each well either father is going to be a father has a father every male oh Okay, I was trying to be less specific. Anyway, anyway, <laughs> make sure you you don't leave. Uh, Barb's going to assist in making sure everyone gets a, uh, a small gift of appreciation. I know uh, we culture has been trying very hard to discount men in society, and we want to promote that even more so. Make sure that it is godly men that we promote, and raising godly children the next generation. So we want to just encourage all you men for that and to hope that you're following, with, following up as an example, not only to your children, but to your grandchildren as well. I think that should take care of the morning's announcement. Let's stand together with hymn number 48, Come Thou Almighty King.
please remain standing. I'm going to share some verses from John 15. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may be, bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By my Father, by this my Father is glorified, that you may bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. We thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for your word. Pray that you impress upon our hearts this morning. Help us to be fully committed to you. Lord, we know you are faithful in all things, and so often we stumble, we fail, Lord, but you are faithful. Lord, help us to abide in you, find, find strength in you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for this day that we've gathered together this morning. Pray that you use us this morning as we lift up our voices and worship and, and praise and open up your word and worship you, Lord. Just pray that you use this time for your glory as you do mightily works in our hearts and in our lives. We thank you and may you be glorified. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now please be seated. <coughs> you probably have noticed this, a theme to the music this morning as well, since it is Father's Day. As we look to the, our Heavenly Father, this is my Father's world. <coughs> This is my father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and around me rings the music of the spheres. This majesty and wrapped up entirely in his deity meekness and majesty this is your god meekness and majesty 
majesty, manhood and deity, in perfect harmony, the man who is God, born of eternity, dwells in humanity, kneels in humility, and washes our feet. Oh, what a mystery, meekness and majesty. speaks of God the Father's love for us, how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure. <clears throat> Oh 
stand with this next one. <clears throat> You're the author of creation, the Lord of every man, Let, and your cry of love rings out across the land. <laughs> And every planet has been fashioned by your hand. All creation holds together by the power of your voice. Let the skies declare your glory. Let the land and seas rejoice. You're the author of creation. You're the Lord of every man. And your cry of love brings out across the land. Yet you left the gaze of angels, came to seek and save the lost, and exchanged the joy of heaven for the anguish of the cross. With a prayer you fed the hungry, Silently you suffered that the guilty may go free. You're the author of creation, you're the Lord of every man, and your cry of love brings out across the lands. With a shout you rose victorious. Wrestling victory from the grave And ascended into heaven Leading captives in your way Now you stand before the Father Interceding for your own From each tribe and tongue and nation You are leading sinners home You're the author of creation you're the Lord of every man, and your cry of love brings out across the lands. Amen. You may be seated. Tim is going to uh, share a, a song with us now. I don't know if you know it or not, but the words are going to be displayed on the screen as well. Rick's going to Rick's going to join us on mandolin. Who's a uh, kind of a Christian gospel singer, I guess, he, Buddy Green, and uh, he wrote this song several years ago, several years ago, and yet the the words talk about the home that we're looking forward to. And uh, it's called Sojourner Song. And as we sojourn through this life, our future and home is with Christ. Strong. 
take a sip of water here. A man named Robert Young and Jane West. And the whole concept of the show, I grew up watching this when I was a little boy, was that uh, the man who played, uh, uh, Robert Young played father, he was wise in this show. And his kids and his family would come to him with thoughts and questions. And he was this voice of reason, this voice of wisdom that would impart that to him. Well, you know, we, the application here and the, the analogy is close to where we see our Heavenly Father. Our Heavenly Father, uh, He knows what's best. He's revealed it to us. He's given us His Word. He's given us His Spirit. He's illuminated our mind through the indwelling Holy Spirit. He knows best. And, you know, we look at, the, in the Gospel account here, we're going to be in John chapter 6 today. We look at the Gospel account of Christ he always referred to the Father. I and the Father are one. I speak nothing other than what the Father gives me. I do nothing other than what the Father commands me to do. Over and over and over again, Jesus pointed to the Father. And of course, he served and accomplished his Father's glory. So in John chapter 6, we're going to look at some words here. A lot of words. 
And uh, it, John chapter 6 is really a, a watershed. So fathers, why are our words important? Let me ask you that. Why are our words important? I look back as a father, we have five children, 15 grandchildren, and there was times where I said something and I wish I could have reached out and grabbed those words and pulled them back. But, uh, you know, we're human. We're sinful humans. But why are our words important? As fathers and grandfathers, we've all regretted things we've said. You know, I can look back, look back specifically at things that I said to my children, things that I say to my bride of 40, almost 49 years, and things just recently that I said where we had words and the words weren't always pleasant words and I had to confess those but our words are important because it's the way the father has taught us to communicate you know it's my words sometimes that cause conflict in our marriage and but also fathers grandfathers it is our words of love and encouragement that establish and build relationships as I stand here today and open the word and have a chance to share it with you I pray always it's not my words father let it be your words just use me as a, an open vessel. Let me not color your words. Let me not distract from your words. Let me just speak your words in truth. In Psalm chapter 32, David writes, Who is the man who deserves life and loves length of days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Seek peace and pursue it, David wrote. We need to do that. In our culture today, where a single word results in a, a death, a single word results in strife, a single word results in all sorts of chaos, we need to use our words to seek peace and pursue it. In Psalm chapter 12, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of the earth, refined seven times. Fathers, today, let those be our words. As we look at Christ today in John chapter 6, he spoke words of truth. He spoke words of, of love. He also spoke, spoke words of rebuke, but he did it in love. He did it because he cared about the people. He cared about his disciples. He cared about the truth being said, not necessarily how people felt good about it. We talked about that in Sunday school today. Thank you. That was good. So let me ask you a question. This is a little bit of a quiz. What father said... The philosophy of the schoolroom in one generation will be the philosophy of the government in the next. Anybody know who said that? Isn't, thank you. We have a scholar amongst us. Oh, you hit, you. All right, John, you, you wait on me, brother. <laughs> Did you know that? Now, he said those words 100 and, you know, 50, 60 years ago, right? Isn't it amazing how that has rung true? How about this? Okay, John, wait till I call on you. When I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant, I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished at how, he had how much he had learned in seven years. Who said that? You are right. How did you know that? You're wise, right? Yeah, it was Mark Twain. You know, I, I, I used, before I read, knew that quote, I used to say that. I said, when I was 17, uh, I didn't think my dad was very smart. When I got to be 19, moved, you know, and went off to college, I thought, wow, my dad was a pretty wise man. He gave me some good advice, pointed me in the right direction, taught me, taught me good things, taught me work ethic, taught me honesty, taught me the things of God, and I appreciate that. All right, who said this? A good father is one of the most unsung, appraised, and unnoticed, and yet one of the most valuable assets in our society. Anybody know who that was? All right, John, picture Billy Graham, wise man. A man who really has left his legacy, his thumbprint, his fingerprint on our culture. Not only here, but really around the world. And one more, and you know who this is. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. God, our Father, our Son, Jesus Christ. This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. As a father and grandfather, we say that to our children. Listen to me. They don't always listen. They don't always listen. I didn't always listen to my parents, my dad. 
But as I look back, I realize how wise and loving and kind he really was. And I was not a good son. I was a difficult, ornery little guy. I know. And then I was an ornery big guy. So let's, you know, we think about God. God through the Son spoke creation. And, and our ability to speak words comes from God the Father. In Genesis chapter 1, God said, God said 12 times, God said, let there be light. Let there be. Let. God spoke. God spoke. And 12 times he said, uh, and he said, God said, and then it says four times, and he called. He called it good. So even in creation, before we were all here, God was using language, words, to accomplish his perfect will. And he's given us the, boy, the, the, the beauty of words, the beauty of languages. I think there's over 6,500 languages in the, word, in the world today. Languages and words are everywhere. Of course, in our culture, there's a few predominant languages, but you get around the world in different uh, countries, hundreds and thousands of languages. And people use these languages to communicate. Our context today is John chapter 6, the bread of life, if you have your Bible open there. In John chapter 6, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Here's the context. This is, I, I mentioned earlier, it's kind of a watershed um, book or chapter of John. And in John chapter 6, 1 through 14, Jesus fed 5,000 people by the sea, of the sea of Galilee. The next segment in the book, we see Jesus goes to the other, uh, the disciples go out on the lake and Jesus comes walking on the Sea of Galilee that night to help them out. And then they arrive in Capernaum. So we see this transition. Well, what happened to the 5,000 people? They're running after Jesus. We're, this is our guy. Hey, Jesus, free food, free health care. He's going to deliver us from the Romans. That was Jesus. That was Jesus. In John chapter 6, verse 26, we see the, the story start to shift here. Jesus' words to the people as he declares in verse 35, I am the bread of life. The bread of life, that was an important statement because it is bread that they worked for and ate every single day. That was the sustenance of life, was bread. So when Jesus looked at him and said, Wow. All right. We needed a break, right? When Jesus not, you know, he didn't need a microphone. When Jesus said, I am the bread of life, they understood what he was saying. And then, in, uh, is this louder? Let me move it. I'm going to move it down a little bit. I'm scaring the children. John chapter 6, verse 41. Jesus' words confronting the Jewish, Jewish skeptics while declaring his glory. He confronted them, and we're going to see that today. So our Father knows best. And we're going to look at his words today. Let me pray. Father, uh, speak to us now through your word. May your spirit uh, illuminate our hearts and minds. Lord, may we obey these words. May we understand these words. May you use these words to refine us for your glory. And I pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I've got some uh, just simple headers for, these, for this, uh, this chapter. We're going to look at verses 60 through 71, the last part of this chapter today. And uh, under Father Knows Best, I call the first verse... Uh, verse 60, which is really a contextual start for this chapter, or for this, this passage within this chapter. Verse 60, let me read this. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? Now, the word disciples there literally means a follower. Uh, I'm going to follow this guy. I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to follow him. It's kind of a broad term, and, that'll, and as we'll see, it included false disciples, skeptical disciples. It also uh, included uh, significant um, disciples. I call that the, the 11, not the 12, even though Judas was named as a disciple. So divisive word. First of all, who was offended? If you look back at verse 16, he said, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? Have you ever had somebody say something to you that offended you? And what do we do? Somebody says a word, you step back and say, what did you say? Or you say a word, maybe you're driving down in Colorado, I-25, and people pull out a gun and shoot you as you're going by because they're offended by you. 
But it says many of his disciples, not necessarily the 12, but the throng of the followers who were now Jesus, this throng of people that was following Jesus. Here's the guy. By the way, this is about two years into his earthly ministry. He had about a year before he went to the cross. Look, if you got your Bible over in there, John 6, turn back to John chapter 6, verse 26 through 29. I'm going to read this. Verse 26, Jesus answered and said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and the bread. What? Free food. Come see Jesus, right? Free food. I love... Uh, in Colorado, uh, in California, you have the In-N-Out, right? The big arrow, like right here. We have a, in Castle Rock where I live, we have an In-N-Out, the big yellow arrow here. And that's what the people saw about Jesus, free food. We're going to In-N-Out there. He says, do not work for food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, the Father God has set his seal. Jesus. The Father God had sent his seal on Jesus and sent him to deliver the message. Therefore they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that what? You believe in him who he has sent. Believe in me. Believe in me. You need to trust me. You need to believe me. You need to obey me. So many of his disciples were offended. So second question is why were they offended? Why were they offended? Well, Jesus' demands for discipleship became abundantly clear here in this passage. Look at uh, back at John 6, 40, 47 through 58. He said, truly, truly, this is, a, this is the difficult passage. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. There's that statement again. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. They ate bread and they died. This is the bread, talking about himself, which comes down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I give for, and will give for the life of the world is my flesh. He was referring to his crucifixion, the, the, the giving of his body as a sacrifice. Now it gets difficult, verse 52. Then the Jews began to argue with one another, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourself. All good Jews know you didn't eat. That was a Levitical law. That was a Mosaic law. You didn't eat, flesh, you didn't eat meat with blood and let alone drink it. They're like, Whoa, what is this guy talking about? He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. You know, I, as I read that, you think about that. How many uh, advertisements and things do you see for, uh, you want to lose 50 pounds? Drink this at night before you go to bed. You'll lose 50 pounds. All sorts of wild, uh, wild <laughs> offers out there that are not true. But Jesus said, eat my flesh, drink my blood. For my flesh is true food, my blood is true, true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I am him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me and is also will live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. So the disciples, the Jews, the Pharisees, they're all standing back and saying, Whoa, what is this? So the third question here is, how are they reconciled then? They were, they were offended. Who was offended? How, why were they offended? And how are they reconciled? Well, they need to submit to faith and obedience in Jesus Christ. Luke 6, 46, Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I say? They called him Lord, but when Jesus showed them the path of discipleship to believe in him and follow him and accept what the Father had provided, they walked away. Like many false disciples, the people followed Jesus, what they thought they could get from him. Is that our world today? What's in it for me, right? What, do, what does my flesh need? What do my desires need? What, I need to follow Christ. I need to believe. We need to cut through that message. True disciples come humbly, expecting nothing, recognize Christ as their only savior, not as a conquering king. He is a king. He is a king. We will serve him forever. 
but as he was explaining this to the people and using the analogy of his death, his flesh, his blood, they were like, we're out of here. So uh, verse 60 there is really, uh, that kind of sets the context. So let's go on and read uh, verse 61. I'm not going to read all these at once. I'm going to read verse 61 and 62 here. I call this uh, from grumbling to glory. Christ's omniscience <clears throat> was revealed here. But Jesus, conscious that his disciples grumbled as he said as, at this, said to them, How does this cause you to stumble? What then if you see the Son of Man ascending where he was before? Christ's omniscience, he began to show who he was. This, he knew their thoughts, he knew their hearts, he knew their response. That word there, stumble, is the Greek word scandalon or scandalizo, means to literally stumble to death, to take offense, to cause one to sin. In Matthew chapter 16, we see Jesus turning to Peter. And, you know, I love Peter. He's a, he was the disciple who... Jesus loved him, but Peter had him, uh, he had this drive and this person, he was a tight double A guy. But Peter said, he says to Peter, get behind me, Satan, you are a stumbling, a scandal on to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. How often do we find ourselves there? I know I do. We think we are pursuing the things of God, we're accomplishing ministry, and then I realized, wow, I'm just out here flailing in the flesh, trying to accomplish something I think well, God will find pleasure in, when really I need to humble myself before the Lord and do what he would ask me to do. Christ refers to his future ascension as proof of his deity in chapter 62. He said, I am the Lord. You're going to see me go. As I, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go. You're going to see me ascend to the Father. So we see from grumbling to glory. The second, second part in verse 63, I call this the spirit versus the flesh. This is something we all struggle with. Let me read verse 63. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. It's the spirit of God and it's the spirit in the life of God. The spirit, the life of uh, the word of God. Uh, we see this example in the Chapter, in Luke chapter 8, the parable of the sower. The seed is the word of God. The sower goes out to sow the seed. That's the word of God. And we know it, and you know the, the parable of the sower. It falls on all kinds of areas. Some falls on the path, some falls on the rocks, some falls on good soil. It goes down, it puts out roots, it bears fruit. Uh, Peter wrote in his epistle in chapter 1, You have been born again, not of a seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, that is through the living and enduring word of God. What a blessing, the living and enduring word of God. We have it, we hold it. You know, I was, uh, I just recently in my, I work from home in my office and I, I needed another bookshelf. I'm a book guy. And uh, I got looking at how many Bibles and how many translations I have. I think I have 18 or 19 Bibles on my shelf. And <laughs> Of course, you read the Bible, and it's always good to have different translations, but I'm thinking, this is the living and enduring word of God. I don't need 18 or 19 copies of it. I should share those around. But so, um, in John 8, 47, Jesus said, He who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason you do not hear them, because you are not of God. Why does the word reject the, the good seed of the word of God? They don't know God. They're, the words are foolishness. So we have this contrast, continual contrast, between the spirit, which gives life through the word, and the flesh, which leads us to death, apart from Christ and apart from the truth of his word. Then we see in verse 64 and 65, these are very important verses. We'll talk about this for just a second. Let me read that. Jesus goes on, he says, But there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe, and who it was that would betray him. Of course, he's speaking of Judas at that point. And, he was, and, and others, false disciples. And he was saying, for this reason, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him from the Father. That's where the God has called us and drawn us. If you're here today and you know Jesus Christ, it's because he has drawn you to himself. My life, I grew up in a Christian home. My mom and dad, I was in a, I was in a Bible church 
from day one. Went to camp, went to Awana, uh, VBS, name it. I was there when the doors were open, Sunday morning, Sunday night, we were there. But it wasn't until I was 16 years old that I realized I'd been living in the Christian bubble. And it was when I was 16 that God drew me to himself. And I responded in faith and grace that only God can give. And I became a true believer in Jesus Christ. Until then, I was a false disciple. Looked like a good boy, acted like a good boy most of the time. New Bible verses, a lot of the Bible verses I learned as a young man, I can still remember. But when I became a believer in Jesus Christ, they came to life. And it's that tension between, is God drawing us? What about human responsibility? There's a lot of verses in the Bible that says, you need to believe, you need to do this. I, I'm going to quote John MacArthur. I appreciate uh, what John said about this. In verse, about verses, these verses, 64 and 65, he said, these verses maintain the tension between divine sovereignty and human responsibility found throughout Scripture. And we read that, we see that in so many passages. You need to believe. Well, God's going to draw you. It's God's will. The sovereignty of God that he knew he was calling me from a, as a child. I didn't, I didn't, that faith didn't come fully to me until I was 16 years old. But he says that divine sovereignty and human responsibility found throughout Scripture. He says unbelievers are condemned for their unbelief, but they are lost because the Father did not draw them and condemn some to condemnation in life. We can name some, Judas, Pharaohs, many others in scripture. Uh, Demas, remember Demas? Um, these were companions of Paul, and yet they walked away from truth. You know, we, we, again, we don't know the heart, God does. But he draws those to himself. That's the sovereignty of God. And I'll say this, in my mortal mind, I can't wrap my mind all the way around it, but I believe that because his word tells me and his word illuminates that to us. That's why we proclaim Christ, that we would honor the Father and he would draw those to himself that he has ordained, sovereignly chosen in, his, in his, his purpose. We read verses in John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, there's a human response, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe on his name. Jesus said, this is the work of God that you believe in me whom God has sent. The sovereignty of salvation. What a blessing, what a joy that we know Christ, that he has drawn us to himself, that we rejoice in that. That's why we worship. That's why we praise the name of God. And then in verse 66, sad verse in the scriptures. Let's read this. As a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. These are false disciples. Unregenerate people who rejected the truth and deny the working of the Spirit. They loved Jesus because he fed them and healed them and raised the dead and walked on water. And, and they thought he's going to overthrow this Roman government that we hate, that we have to pay taxes to. These are an example. If you go back to that parable of the sower in Luke chapter 8, these are the rocky soil. And in, in Luke 8, 13, you don't have to turn there. He says, those on the rocky soil, that's where the seed went on the rocks, are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no firm root. They believe for a while, and in time of temptation, they fall away. They really weren't believers. They, liked, they were like me from the time I was born to the time I was 16. I was floating along in the Christian bu bubble, enjoying life as a, in a Christian family, talking about Jesus. I didn't have any root. And then God convicted me, drew him to himself, and saved me. And I praise God for that. Yeah, verse uh, Luke, uh, I'm sorry, John 6, 66, a sad verse. Well, let's go on. Let's finish this up. The last few verses, I call these eternal words. Verse 67 through 71. Let me read this. So Jesus said to the twelve, you do not want to go away also, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. I love Peter's confession. Jesus answered them, did I myself not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? Now he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. So we see here in, 
in these verses, Christ's challenge for commitment. Verse 67 through 69, he turns to the disciples because all the other people started leaving. We're out of here. I'm not following this guy. What? Eat his, eat his flesh and drink his blood. So Jesus turns to his disciples and says, you do not want to go away, do you? I love Peter. When Jesus spoke to the disciples, it was usually Peter who spoke up. He was the spokesman for the group. And he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? Whom shall we go? So what's our commitment this morning? Are we in it for life and death? You know, one of the things that as a mission director, church planning mission, I, that I, I, I'll just admit it's a little discouraging, is we're struggling to find qualified men to go and serve the Lord in churches. People, you know, I went to, I speak at uh, colleges, I spoke at Frontier School of the Bible here last, last year. Uh, good school. They train, train men well for ministry. Uh, that class, there was six graduates, pastoral majors, that wanted to go into ministry. And I went to a uh, church planning conference and a missionary conference there. There was probably 22, 25 organizations trying to recruit these six guys. These six guys. We need, we need churches like this to raise up godly men from, from the seats who would say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to forsake this world. I'm going to follow Christ. I've been called of God, not only for salvation, but I've been called of God to go and to preach and to give my life for the ministry. And that's Christ's challenge for commitment. It's, it's life and death. This world is short. It's coming to pass. When I stand before the Lord someday, I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. I know you do too. Dependent on who that, dependent on what that is, and who God has called, um, you know. Matthew chapter 16, Jesus said to him, "But who do you say that I am?" This is Peter again. He said to the disciples, "Who do you say that I am?" Je Simon Peter said, "You are the Christ, the Son of the Living God." I love what Jesus said. He said, "He said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven." Do you know Jesus today? Has God revealed Himself to you? I trust and pray that he has. Then we see in verse 70 and 71, Christ chosen, God's sovereign choosing. One is a false disciple to accomplish even divine purposes. When, God, when Jesus turned and said, I've chose you to be my disciples and ultimately apostles, even his choosing as the apostolic mission, mission he chose Judas to accomplish the betrayal. That was God's perfect choice. Why he did that? I, I, I can't sort it out, but God knew. You know, we, you, we see the passages in the Old Testament about Pharaoh. He was an instrument of God's purpose in, defeat, or in pursuing the nation of Israel across into the Red Sea, and, of course, we know how that ended. Uh, in Matthew chapter 22, many are called, few are chosen. The, the gospel call goes out to the entire world, but God calls out of that world, people to come to him. Christ's calling here in this last little segment here is not for salvation, but apostleship. He wanted those, these 11 men, not Judas, to serve him, and they did. We understand without going into the history of the apostolic ministry, all these men, except for the apostle John, died martyrs' death. They died physical death because of their ministry to Christ. After the day of Pentecost, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and empowered and went out and did marvelous works, wrote most of the New Testament, some of these men. So Christ calling here. And finally, I'll, just a challenge. What are you and I called to this morning? I don't know what you're called to. Back in my home church in Liberty Bible Church in Eureka, um, great sending church. They're sending people out. They send, I served in the church for 30 years. They sent me out as a missionary. Um, they're sending out young men. They're training young men. I was part of a team that trained elders at our church. What a joy to see these men that I trained 15, 20 years ago now being ready to go out and to be pastors, and some of them are missionaries. We see God doing the work. It's hard work. It doesn't happen overnight. We look at the Apostle Paul and his life, how he, he went out. He was a miraculous conversion. He didn't immediately go preach. He was discipled, he was mentored, he was taught by God, and then he was commissioned. So as we conclude here, our Father knows best.
It's not just us as fathers, our Heavenly Father knows best. God's divine word was manifested, manifested fully in Jesus Christ. His word is truth. I love the, the, priest, uh, the, high, call it the high priestly prayer of John chapter 17. Jesus said, you know, I have accomplished what you've sent me to do. I have accomplished what you've sent me to do. Have we accomplished today or are we pursuing what God has called us to do? Because it is through the Son that we know the Father. As I close here, let me read a couple of verses here. I love John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He, Christ, was in the beginning with God. And all things came to being through him, and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. God the Father, through the Son, to us in ministry. Isaiah chapter 48, again, as we finish with this, the words of the Father, the grass withers, the flower fades, the word of our God stands forever. Happy Father's Day, men. We have work to do, and God is depending on us to be faithful and obedient. Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning for your word. As Jesus said, your word is truth. We take great comfort in that. We wrestle not with the truth of your word, but obedience to your word. Oh, Father, empower us through your spirit to be your faithful servants, to give our lives for the gospel of Jesus Christ, to be able to speak words of truth, words of kindness, words of love, sometimes maybe even words of correction as we do that in love. Thank you for our time this morning here at Bethany, and I thank you for uh, the ministry here, Lord. We lift up our brother Dennis this morning and Linda, and I thank you for their faithful ministry and service here, Lord. Pray your hand of blessing and healing on Dennis. Thank you for this good man. As we uh, go our ways this morning, Lord, use us for your glory, because you alone are worthy of our praise, and in his name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 54. Now let us stand with Great is Thy Faithfulness. I remain standing. Uh, Pastor Tim will close us in prayer. And don't forget, uh, Barb will come down and make sure you men have the gift before you leave. Let's stand with Great is Thy Faithfulness.
thank you for your faithfulness. What a father. May we look to you for our strength, our hope, our encouragement, the words from your word that guide our hearts. May we be your faithful servants. Thank you for this time together this morning. As we go, we rejoice in our Savior, whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>